So good morning, everyone. It's uh, an honor to uh, get the opportunity to chair the session after a very sort of a great opening to this conference. Um, and uh, I think it's also uh, great that we're having an opportunity to have the first session focus on some of the real world issues around developmental programs and development effectiveness. Uh, and uh, I have with me a very esteemed panel. We have, I believe, one hour. Uh, and uh, the format is something I'll follow. I think Manny sort of laid the, con the context. And I'll follow the same format as he has followed. So we have a total of six panelists, right? One, two, three, four, five panelists. Let me just lay the context for this sort of session. It was a little open-ended. So last night, I was sort of wondering how we can make the session frankly, to be a useful one. And I also you know, tried to get some uh, insights from the panelists before uh, the session started. So this is an operational session. Uh, we have funding agencies, founding uh, uh, foundations. Uh, within this panel, we have all our practitioners working in large-scale developmental programs. And all of uh, the incentives that we have is to uh, you know, improve effectiveness, to show effectiveness through better data, through better evidence-based uh, measures and effect, uh, sort of measures in, in our programs. We've understood that everybody has a stake, but what have been the experiences of various stakeholders in interfacing in governmental programs? Whether it's evaluation agencies who actually do the evaluations, whether it's donors who have clearly an incentive to want to show the effectiveness of the resources that they invest, or governmental systems who increasingly now are investing huge amounts of resources, as we heard, and also have to show uh, that policies around, say, doubling farmer incomes that serve as a template for a lot of rural development and agriculture programs now are actually addressing some of these uh, requirements of improving incomes, improving welfare, and so forth. So while these are all in place, it's not that easy. And when we interface within governmental programs, we face a lot of operational challenges. There are concerns. And let, if I were to play devil's advocate, uh, I've understood over the years that even though an impact evaluation can technically be done in a development program, it may not necessarily be done. One has to be very careful about when do you do impact evaluations and when do you not do it. There are issues around uh, incentives and trade-offs there are issues about what is the timing to do the right impact evaluation. You can get one of the best impact evaluation agencies at a wrong time to do the impact evaluation. Uh, and there are, of course, structural constraints that uh, do not forge good outcomes, that do not force the right incentives. Uh, does the government uh, you know, provide those incentives in terms of uh, is there a policy that all development programs should have good data and, and measures to come up with good outcomes. So those are sort of the types of questions we want to, to get perspectives on from the multi-stakeholder group. So uh, let me start maybe uh, from, uh, give me a second, let me just sort of, we'll, the, the format we'll try to follow is that we'll try to make this a panel discussion. So I do want to take, give each of the panelists about three or four minutes to make opening uh, remarks. The remarks should please focus on what have been the experiences of your institution in working in large-scale development programs with impact evaluations. Uh, what have been some of the operational challenges? So maybe you can just highlight something at a more programmatic, at a policy level, at a programmatic level. You're working with national governments, state governments. I'd, I'd request you to sort of focus on uh, those types of issues. And of course, when, when we open it up to the panel discussion, we'll talk about uh, how do you resolve them? What are ways to overcome these challenges? So let me start maybe uh, from, uh, so let me start from that side and, and ladies first. So let's go with Sunita Krishnan. She's the country lead for measurement, learning, and evaluation at the BMGF, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And her team is responsible for grant making to inform and inv evaluate the foundation's investments in India's health and development and to enhance the national evaluation ecosystem. She, she has a very important role. She's been looking at evaluations from the BMGF side. And uh, welcome, Sunita, to give her opening remarks. 
I request you to keep uh, focused to about three minutes, and because we literally would like this to be a provocative panel discussion. So, uh, Sunita, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much, and good morning to everyone. It's a, a real pleasure and honor to be here. Um, so, let, let me start by just providing a little bit of, of context as to um, how the Gates Foundation, um, what motivates us to invest in evaluations and what kinds of questions uh, we, um, we explore through evaluation. So, evaluation plays two, two roles. One is um, to provide insights on where best the Gates Foundation can invest um, you know, its resources in supporting national and state governments in India to um, achieve health and development goals. So we look to evaluation to tell us um, you know, what, are the, what are the key problems, challenges um, where, where resources can be effectively deployed. Uh, we also use evaluation to then assess whether the deployment of our resources are actually helping um, our partners, namely government, to in fact make progress towards those goals. And thirdly, uh, we deploy evaluations in support of government's own programming um, to assist the government in assessing whether government's resources and energies and efforts are being more effective, are being most effectively um, implemented, used and implemented towards those goals. So there are a couple of different kinds of imperatives that drive uh, our evaluations, right? So there's eva the way we use evaluation to inform ourselves, our internal sort of um, strategy and how we engage with partners like the bank as well as with national state governments. But then also we use evaluation to help governments better understand how their policies and the, the resources that they deploy towards program implementation are actually um, having an impact or not. Um, so that's sort of the broad framework. Um, within that, um, and, and let me focus my remarks primarily on the way we use our resources to assist um, governments in better understanding uh, their policies and programs. And I think there, the, the one issue that I wanted to bring up for discussion was um, to do with sort of the, the way, the intersection of the imperatives and expectations of the different stakeholders that get involved in um, evaluating um, the investment of public funds and government's policies and, and programs. Um, and by imperatives and expectations, I mean decision makers within government, program implementers, communities, donors like the Gates Foundation and evaluation agencies like 3IE, for example, are all driven by different kinds of imperatives. The, they get involved in evaluation, uh, in the evaluative enterprise, for somewhat, some, different kind, some different reasons, right? And they bring different sets of questions, skill sets, and mindsets to, um, to, to uh, the table. So the decision to launch um, schemes, implement programs, are also, um, they're a result of multiple factors, um, but the way we address whether those schemes and programs are actually having impact um, are also being uh, addressed and approached from different vantage points. And in my experience and observation, um, the ways in which these imperatives and expectations actually intersect and come together is, is really influential in determining whether an evaluation happens in the first place and whether the evaluation uh, then produces uh, the kinds of um, sort of um, future actions that we um, would like evaluations to have. And by that I mean, you know, whether government um, stakeholders are actually able to use the information that's being produced from evaluation. And Nupur alluded to that, you know, is information being packaged, being synthesized, packaged, communicated in ways that decision makers and program implementers can actually use them um, and apply them. Um, but on the other hand, you know, evaluation agencies, um, 3IE, academics, etc., are also driven by, um, you know, imperatives of their own. And the success of an, of an evaluation also depends on whether those individuals can also further those imperatives, right? Can academics 
um, involved in evaluations? Can they, you know, can, can they produce more generalizable knowledge that will contribute to their discipline and to their field? Um, they're often assessed, their success is often assessed on the basis of whether they've published. Um, are they free to publish the findings of an evaluation, no matter how uncomfortable or challenging or difficult those findings might be? Um, so the opportunities for an evaluation really emerge from these different kinds of imperatives and expectations being made explicit and also being aligned. Um, and I think recognition and acceptance of these def deferring imperatives and expectations is really the first step to being able to establish collaborations um, and then developing terms of engagement um, and the establishment of trust that can um, enable evaluations to be, um, to be successful. Um, so let me, let me conclude by saying that the essence of, I think, the success of whether an evaluation or a set of evaluations um, occur and whether they actually lead to useful outcomes and are perceived as being useful by the multiple stakeholders involved really depends on the um, opportunities, the spaces, and the commitment to engaging in what I would call productive interactions. Are these different stakeholders committed to investing time, energy, um, in developing relationships with each other so that they can actually you know, be explicit about what those imperatives that drive them and what their expectations are and come to an agreement around um, what an evaluation um, should, should do, right? Um, what kinds of questions it should answer and how, um, how the information uh, will get used. So, so let me conclude there. I think my, my sort of point for discussion is do we have you know, sufficient numbers, uh, a number of spaces? Um, are we creating sufficient number of opportunities for government decision makers, program implementers, um, academics, um, you know, evaluation agencies and, and, and donors to actually engage with each other so that we can better understand what are the imperatives that drive us, what are the questions that we seek to answer through evaluation, um, and, um, you know, are, and are those spaces and opportunities, um, you know, if they exist, are they functioning optimally um, and are they leading to the kinds of results that we'd like to see. So thanks, Sunita. That was very insightful. I think we'll come back to the, uh, you know, some of these points that you raised during the panel discussion. This whole thing about balancing imperatives versus expectations, creating a platform for collaboration and trust as a very starting point for sensitizing various stakeholders about the need for impact evaluations and the good points it can bring in terms of learning and accountability. I think that's something that's extremely important. It sort of lays the context very well. Let's move forward. We have now Anand Kothari. Uh, he's uh, from the Oxford Policy Management's India office. He works with the uh, JSLPS, with his, the Jharkhand State Livelihoods Promotion Society one of the front-running societies under the NRLM that is uh, working on women's empowerment and rural livelihoods, as many of you would know. And uh, within that, he works for a state government project uh, with the government of Jharkhand called Johar. And he's been leading our work uh, there. Uh, and he, in the past, he's worked very deeply on rural livelihood projects in Bihar as well. Um, comes with uh, a lot of experience in this sector. I know that uh, Kutha Anand has recently uh, completed a baseline evaluation, a rigorous baseline evaluation, which is in fact an RCT for the state of Jharkhand. Uh, the results of that baseline are out, and he's going to be working with us for the coming years in that very important state. He has training is in development economics, and he has degrees from the universities of Manchester and Mumbai. So Anand, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you, Preeti, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm representing Oxford Policy Management here, and uh, we're very pleased to have been invited to this panel to talk about our experience uh, working with the SRLM in Jharkhand. As Preeti was mentioning, uh, the Johar project in Jharkhand has had a, a RCT which has been designed and uh, implemented from the outset, and we've managed a randomized rollout within a large-scale government program. So this is something for everybody involved to be very happy about uh, people who are interested in furthering the agenda of evidence-based policy making. Uh, and some of the other experience that I've had of working and you know working with evaluations in government systems. 
I'd like to share some of my uh, learnings from there and you know how that would be useful for this panel and the audience over here. So, you know, evaluations or if you look at m as a whole system is is meant for measurement and learning, not just measurement. And uh, so, you know, in my experience, it's important to get a certain kind of balance right uh, when you're uh, kind of designing, pl planning for designing and implementing m systems in large scale projects. Uh, usually there are a bunch of different stakeholders involved, you know, you have a implementing organization, you have funding donor organizations, you have a couple of different kinds of organizations. Often what happens is that the funding and donor type of organizations uh, demand a lot of rigor and detail. Implementing organizations prefer simple and uh, quick work. And getting this balance is very essential. Um, if we don't get this balance right when we dis uh, plan for and design m &E, what happens is that it, there's this danger of uh, m &E being seen as a kind of externally imposed uh, system and it just needs to be done and something that's been imposed on an implementing <coughs> organization. So getting that balance is very right and I think you know, some of this is partly because of the perspectives that different people have. The former type of organization that I spoke about, the funding and donor organizations, not always, but uh, often have an accountability perspective. Uh, implementing organizations are looking more at learning and strategy. Uh, and you know, this rigor and complexity that we try and sometimes force onto m and &E systems, or you know, a lot of m and &E practitioners, uh, uh, experts uh, like to include, it kind of, uh, ends up being exclusionary for implementing organizations, people on the ground, because people don't get specialized jargon. So we need to be careful about that as well. Um, I'd also like to uh, say that it's very important that m and &E teams also have, you know, people on these teams who have a programmatic view and are able to see, uh, see it from that lens, because, uh, you know, that kind of helps them work with uh, program teams to make uh, findings more constructive. And uh, I kind of like to end with uh, saying that, uh, you know, m and &E professionals or, you know, evaluators should uh, kind of have a shared responsibility with, uh, with program teams on achieving outcomes, uh, not just kind of leave it at measurement. Thank you. Thanks, Anand. So I think uh, I would take your last <coughs> sentence as the key takeaway, and we'll come back during uh, the panel discussion around shared responsibilities. Uh, it's not about just the government doing it or just the bank or funding agencies pushing it. I, I do indeed, from experience, feel that it is, it's, we have to develop a notion of a common team and spearhead the whole thing right from design to closure of the program together. That's extremely critical. So. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, we will now move on to Ronald Abraham, who is the founding partner and India director of ID Insight. Uh, he has been responsible for India's regional strategy growth and impact from ID Insight. He leads the ID Insights unit at Niti Aayog, supporting the aspirational districts program. Uh, he was, uh, he was uh, involved earlier with AP Society for Elimination of Rural Poverty, previously to this position. Ronald has worked on with Pratham uh, on a, he's worked as their lead for the statewide learning program with the government of Punjab, that is in the education sector, and then Pratham, he's also an alumnus. He, he's an alumnus of the St. Stephen's Delhi University in Harvard Kennedy School. So over to you, Ronald. Thank you so much, and thank you for this opportunity as well. Um, I feel like uh, Sunita and Anand have stolen my thunder. I basically had two big things to say and they've said both of them. Um, I think the first thing being that um, different organizations coming together do come with different agendas. I think Sunita used, used a softer word, imperatives. Um, and I think finding alignment is critical. And then as Anand, you said that there are these, um, how these agendas play out between uh, measurement partners and implementing organizations. I think. To kind of build on those two points, I would say that um, uh, for ID Insight and in our experience, um, what has been valuable is to try and use these challenges about these different 
objectives that different organizations have and try to convert them into opportunities. Um, as an organization, I would say that one of ID Insight's founding principles um, has been how do we bring in a strong element of rigor from research into practical decision making that is beneficial for government. That has essentially been the orienting principle for us as an organization. And to that extent, therefore, we don't always think of these as challenges, but really as opportunities, because that's what the need of the hour is. Um, so the main model that we've used um, to do this, um, it started with um, a, a concurrent evaluation, evaluation cell that we did in Bihar with the energy department and then since then with various government organizations and also with nonprofits, it is what we call a learning partnership model. There are a couple of key like aspects to that model. One is that um, partnerships need to be long term um, because agendas um, that are short term uh, are not going to be in allowing us to actually uh, reach last mile impact. Another piece is that we need to ensure that we are having a broad suite of analytical skills and tools that are enabled that enable us to actually answer the relevant questions that come from practitioners so don't go with one hammer looking for the right nail instead go with a full toolkit um, another key piece is to build a strong element of trust between the different organizations that are involved and I think that goes to the point that both the previous speakers have made about alignment and ensuring that there's alignment to, to final outcomes. Um, I, to just give you a couple of sort of nuts and bolts on how this can, you know, how this operationalizes on the ground. So what are some of these kind of challenges um, of working with governments in addition to, of course, the sort of the broad uh, piece around alignment? One is that typically, um, Government practitioners have a much higher demand for speed. Um, everything needs to be turned around much more rapidly. Um, so we, uh, we think of that at ID Insight as an opportunity because there are various different operational ways that researchers can employ, that deploy to actually bring up the speed of what they're doing. Um, for example, with um, our work with Niti Aayog, um, over time as we've been working with them, we've now been able to turn around um, surveys about 30,000 households across eight states um, in about four to six weeks. So this is a speed, and these are two, uh, two hour surveys with households across six sectors. These are complex things, complex survey instruments that we're able to deploy with speed while maintaining a strong level of data quality. Now there's an example of, and there were lots of technological and operational innovations that enabled us to do this. It's an example of trying to use what is usually presented as a constraint, but actually trying to convert that into an opportunity. Um, similarly, we also see that um, governments often, um, uh, government leadership often has a strong amount of turnover. Um, and this is, where, uh, this is where it's really useful to actually have that longer term partnership and a longer term vision. We've seen that often, even when leadership does actually transition within government, the incoming leader may have specific ideas um, on how to do things, but there is always a broad alignment on the final goal. And therefore, that alignment and long-term partnership enables us to be able to sort of transcend that, uh, uh, that moment. Um, and I'd like to end by saying that we see, you know, uh, as, me as researchers and, and also as funders, we see um, sometimes having uh, uh, the various challenges that we see with government as challenges or obstacles. But ultimately, what matters is that we have sort of, all of us have final clients which are beneficiaries on the ground, and governments as democratically elected governments are the sort of main decision makers and it's critical to ensure that we try to see how we can innovate to answer the needs of our practitioners on the ground. They're the ones who are entrenched, uh, who are working um, on the ground, and we have to figure out how to innovate and how to um, answer those questions. Because today, if you just look at the landscape of decisions that are being made, trillions of dollars are being spent, 
and most of that are being spent because of either ideology or anecdote. Um, and so even though you know, there's this huge measurement sector, we've really only you know, touched the uh, tip of the iceberg in terms of actually informing deep decision and strategy in an evidence-oriented manner, in a manner that really embraces the voice of the poor that we're trying to help, and in a way that uh, clearly enables progress. And I think instead of saying that's the problem, we have to say that's the opportunity. Thanks, excellent. Very practical, good <laughs> suggestions uh, around learning partnerships, around developing a broad suite of analytical tools. You emphasized the element of trust. So that was all uh, very well taken. And of course, you also talked about expertise and having uh, strong people needed on both sides of the, of the teams. So let's move forward. We have now a different perspective. We've heard now from funding agencies primarily. We will move to uh, 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 a person who is representing a state government, the state government of Jharkhand, Mr. Bipin Bihari. He is the project director of a large uh, uh, program on agriculture and rural transformation that the government of Jharkhand is implementing over six years. Uh, Mr. Bip uh, Bihari uh, we is known very well to us in the bank because uh, the Jharkhand Rural Opportunities Harnessing, uh, sorry, Jharkhand Opportunities for Harnessing Rural Growth. In fact, I'm the TTL of that and I, it's, it sounds like a mouthful sometimes. The Johar Project as we more sort of uh, easily know, know about it. He's the project director for this. Bipin, interestingly, uh, comes from outside the government. He has about 32 years of experience in senior management with Indian and multinational companies like Reliance, ITC, and so forth. He's also been previously with the Ministry of Agriculture, the famous SFAC program of the government on agribusiness and uh, in, in this area. He was with them uh, for many years. Bipin has uh, very good technical expertise in the area of agribusiness, value chain development, inclusive markets, FPO formation, and so forth. And uh, he's been with the government of Jharkhand. He literally rep represents the officials. He represents the authorizing environment from the government of Jharkhand. And we felt that it's important. This, in fact, we were wanting to get some more government officials on this panel to understand the other side of uh, the perspectives of impact evaluations. So, Bipin, you are uh, going to help us get a perspective from the government side. <coughs> what are the concerns? What are the opportunities? What, what are the genuine issues that governments face when going ahead with uh, these types of measurement uh, solutions? <coughs> thanks, Preeti. And uh, thanks to all of the organizers here. Uh, for giving me an opportunity to come and share my views and wish you all a very happy new year. <clears throat> so this is the kind of uh, approach I adopt being in government just to please everybody with very soft kind of approach. Uh, Mr. Anand has given you perspective from OPML side because he's working with uh, our project and uh, he has done a baseline survey and uh, also doing uh, uh, all sort of process monitoring aspects. <coughs> so it's very important in the project to understand where we were at the beginning of the project. What was the existing environment level when the project is started? And uh, he has looked at that, he has given the feedback to us <coughs> And in between also, he keeps monitoring it and keeps telling the whole team where we are going and whether we are doing the right things or not, what we had set our goals on, whether we are able to achieve that or not. And if we don't know that, probably at the end of the project, we will not be on the level where we want to be at the end of six years. But uh, I just wanted to tell you the government perspective. We all want to have a very good database, very good m and &E agencies, very good analysis. But when we actually go in the field, we find that the situation is slightly different. By field, I mean on the ground with the rural people, with the farmers, and at the same time in the government offices. One of the major things 
what we find the factors which affects us in government offices <coughs> that suddenly we'll have to change our gear and we have to go to the speed so speed is one of the very important thing in the government where we have to run the project with what uh, the government is thinking there may be change in the government there may be uh, change in the ideologies there is a lot of data which is kept very secret even with the monitoring agencies even with the other people outsiders because those secret data are not supposed to be uh, divulge to other uh, uh, members at the same time there is always a lack of resources somewhere you will find uh, resources are unutilized and many a places you find the resources are being moved to other uh, uh, directions so we have to live with that another thing is that uh, so, uh, sometimes the process takes a lot of time the kind of time we believe that uh, the decision making should take actually it's not that the file keeps moving from one desk to other desk and people are not available for that kind of urgency and priority which we have set for our own project so that's the kind of problem uh, we face there in government and we have to live with it the resources we have to manage the time we have to manage still we have to complete the project in time because that is a commitment not only given to the donors and uh, uh, evaluation agencies but that's the commitment given to the government and uh, we have to live with all these things uh, so these are the factors we have to live uh, live with this but uh, certainly having the mne agencies does help the project because if we have an uh, good evaluating agencies they tell us what is going on where to go and at the same time we get a very good capable in house agency who keeps on not only monitoring the data and monitoring your results but also does train the internal people on the data aspect because when you have people working in government and shifting from uh, because in government one of the thing is that uh, we have multiple responsibilities it's not only one project or one department there are multiple uh, responsibilities and also not that much of expertise in that area where we are uh, working so what happens that uh, you know suddenly a person will be transferred to a different uh, a department and that person has to handle all the requirement of that particular project so with this multiple directions with this multiple experience we have to work uh, accordingly so we have to train those people internally for the project and there an mnd agency becomes very useful because they keep having internal training and uh, they train the people to work closely on that certainly we are there to achieve the objective to do it within a particular time and uh, mnd is very helpful uh, in that direction and uh, with all these uh, constraints the government agency are poised to uh, uh, fulfill this uh, uh, project requirements and i was just i will uh, close uh, 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 my insights here uh, with what i heard many saying in the uh, morning that uh, the whole world is uh, watching india i want to see it that uh, some day he will start telling that the whole world is following india thanks <laughs> thanks uh, bipin that was very good uh, very insightful we'll move on to emmanuel mani Jimenez, who is the executive director of the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation 3IE. Since he was introduced this morning, I will not go through the whole thing. Let's, let's get the benefit of hearing Manny. So Manny, please. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Priti. Uh, and uh, I, uh, uh, since uh, you, you were third, you only had to go through two others before you said that they've said everything. Now everyone has gone through and said everything else. Uh, let me just make just a couple of reflections on what I've uh, heard from uh, fr fr from uh, uh, from all of you. Um, uh, one is this: uh, you know, are, are we asking the right questions? I think is one key thing that keeps us as researchers uh, awake. Uh, so, if you look at the, uh, we have about five thousand uh, evaluations in our database uh, of uh, 
uh, evaluations that address this question of attribution uh, over the past 20 years. And, and if you look at the trends in those, uh, uh, well, the majority of them are only in four sectors. Uh, so health, social protection, uh, education, and agriculture. It doesn't mean that they're saturated, okay, uh, those sectors, but it, also, but it means is that very important issues in which governments are spending huge amounts, such as infrastructure, energy, or sectors that cut across, such as governance, uh, are not being subjected to the same level of scrutiny. Uh, and and that, that's, uh, I think, w one issue is why. Uh, one, it could be what you, you mentioned, Ron, that researchers have a tendency to go to those topics that are easier to evaluate. Uh, because of the incentives that you mentioned to publish. That's po one possible reason. The other reason is on the government side, the incentives may be that if you have huge investments, the last thing you want to do know is w whether they work after you already put in, you've built this, this dam. <laughs> it's not going to undo itself uh, very, very quickly. Uh, so, but I think a challenge for us as researchers is then to, how do we make sure that we do the kinds of rigorous evaluations of those really important um, bigger investment items uh, that uh, uh, need, need, need addressing. And what happens if governments don't have an, uh, an interest? A and here, I think that the issue of transparency that some of you mentioned, this, uh, the issue you mentioned, Bipin, very concerning of data secrecy. I think that if we as evaluators make a commitment to making sure that all of our findings are available publicly, that might put pressure <laughs> on governments to actually uh, ensure that they're doing the evaluations themselves. Uh, I reminded the story of Carnival in Mexico. Uh, the head of Carnival once said to me that uh, this is the central evaluation program uh, department of Mexico that he had a hard time convincing ministries to get evaluations done until they started publishing all the ministries that volunteered to have themselves subjected to evaluation every year. The following year, there was a queue of ministries trying to make sure that they were evaluated too because the press were uh, on their case. The other thing I wanted to pick up on was what, what, what a couple of you mentioned uh, on uh, how to make sure that uh, government is already has systems in place for learning, but how to make sure they're implemented well. Uh, we as evaluators would have our jobs easier if data monitoring, the monitoring that's required for data were done well, because that means all the data would be there. A and I think that uh, y you often have to have surveys in addition because the data haven't been there. And I think the quality of data and making sure that uh, just ordinary run-of-the-mill monitoring systems is done well is an agenda item. Uh, when I was in the independent evaluation group at the World Bank, uh, World Bank projects were successful three quarters of the time, which I think was a pretty good track record. Uh, but the one component that was almost always uh, not successful as well <laughs> uh, was monitoring and evaluation of that project. And, and that's because the uh, short term tends to crowd out the long term. So, so one critical part is just simply to do our knitting <laughs> to make sure that things are all already designed are, are done well. Let me stop there. So those were excellent comments, Manny. <laughs>